so let's start at the beginning, back in the, um, the 1800s through to the 1840s. Banks at that time actually had the ability to create money. And the way they did this was through printing uh, pieces of paper. When you put your coins into the bank, they give you a receipt. And that receipt would say you've deposited five pounds. And because it was more convenient to carry bits of paper around than to carry metal coins around, people used to use the pieces of paper as though they were money. They'd actually spend the paper in the shop. And so long as the, um, the shopkeeper knew the bank and trusted the bank, um, he'd accept the paper. So basically, the pieces of paper that banks were issuing were treated as money. And they became as good as money. Now, when the banks caught onto this, they realized that Actually, if we just issue more pieces of paper with sums of money written on them and people treat them as money, then effectively we have the power to create money. So the more that we issue, the more we can lend, and the more we lend, the more interest we get. So you can imagine with incentives like these, um, it didn't end well. Um, they created too much money and it started to cause instability in the economy, it caused banking crises. And after um, you know, a number of years of this happening, the government of the day, so it was the Conservative Prime Minister, Sir Robert Peel, stepped in and said, well, we can no longer allow banks to issue paper money because of the problems that it's causing in the economy. So they passed this uh, piece of legislation, the Bank Charter Act, which said from this point on, only the Bank of England will have the authority to create paper money. But they missed something out because paper money isn't the only way that you can make payments. And with the um, increasing use of cheques, people had a way of making payments using the numbers that were in the uh, ledger books of the banks, the accounting entries. So they had this way of making payments without actually needing the real paper or metal money. Over time, as we discovered electricity, we got debit cards, uh, electronic fund transfers, and uh, internet banking. To the point now where more than 99% of all the money that changes hands does so electronically. The shocking thing is that even though our monetary system now is electronic, this law has never been updated since, well, since 1844, which means that it's just shy of 170 years out of date, the law that actually governs our monetary system. Now, the reason that banks can create money is because the, the liabilities, the accounting entries that they create, are what we are using as money. When you make a, a debit card, you're not using, you know, there's no... Uh, 10 pound notes moving from your account to somebody else's account, it's actually just accounting entries between the banks. And this, uh, the Bank of England explains this quite clearly. They say the, the money creating sector in the United Kingdom consists of resident banks and building societies. Money creating organizations issue liabilities that are treated as a media of exchange by others. Um, and those liabilities are the numbers that you see in your account. Now, what this has meant is with uh, the sort of you know, rise of electronic means of payment is that we've reached the point where... And most of the money in our economy, broad money, comprises liabilities of banks in the form of bank deposits. So most of the money in our economy comprises liabilities of banks in the form of bank deposits. This is, when we talk about 97% of the money supply being created by banks, this is what we're talking about. So this chart of uh, the blue line is the, the bank issued money supply. This is cash down here at the bottom. Um, so the 3% here, this is 3% of all the money that exists. And then this is the 97% of the money supply that is created by the banking sector. And this 3% is what is covered by the law. And this is the 97% that is ignored by the current laws. So it's, I, I always found it curious that there's this um, one part of the state, the police, which is responsible for hunting down and prosecuting anybody who prints their own money privately, or they, they call it counterfeiting. Um, and yet there's a whole other part of the state which actually has more resources and more funding to do everything possible to encourage banks, private companies, to create money. And I could never really understand why this, um, why this contradiction was there and why it was good for uh, electronic money to be created by the private banking sector, but bad if anybody's printing paper money. Now, um, I stumbled across this interview with Paul Fisher on the BBC. When you start printing money, you create some value for yourself. If you can issue a thousand pounds worth of IOUs to everybody, you've got a thousand pounds for nothing. And so we do restrict the ability of people to create their own notes in that way. You're protecting us from ourselves. Uh, 
we're protecting you from charlatans. <laughs> so he, he, was, he was talking about counterfeiting, but for me the key phrase is this. If you can issue a thousand pounds worth of IOUs to everybody, you've got a thousand pounds for nothing. Now what banks do when they make loans is they issue liabilities, IOUs. Um, in the last 10 years alone, banks have issued more than a trillion pounds of these new IOUs, these liabilities. Now, the, the something that they got for nothing was a trillion pounds worth of debt, of interest-bearing contracts. Um, and this is mortgages, personal loans, uh, business loans. This is debt from us to the banking sector. And as you've seen this morning, the total interest that has to be paid on that debt is a transfer from society to the banking sector of between 108 billion to 217 billion every single year. Now, of course, some of this comes back to people through the interest on savings accounts and through the uh, bonuses and the commissions and the taxes that banks pay. But it's still, you know, a huge amount of this is creamed off in the middle. And it's a massive transfer of wealth and it leads to, um, well, it exacerbates inequality. Now, the, um, I think the economists and the people in government who defend this system and say it's something we should keep and it's something useful. I think they do so because they believe it can be controlled. And they believe it can be controlled because they're taught uh, certain stories in economics courses about the money multiplier and that the central bank has control over how much money there is in the economy. We really don't believe it can be controlled and this is one of the reasons why we've settled on this uh, particular style of reform. Uh, but the reason it can't be controlled, for a start, I mean this doesn't look like a money supply that has been controlled. Uh, this is something that's out of control. But even Mervyn King has said that the, the Bank of England's key role has always been to ensure that the economy is supplied with the right quantity of money, neither, neither too much nor too little. For 50 years, my predecessors struggled to prevent there being too much, so leading to inflation. I find myself in the opposite situation of having to explain that there is too little money in the economy. So this is the most powerful man at one of the most powerful central banks in the world, admitting for that the last half a century they have struggled to keep the banks under control, to keep the money supply under control. And if you get an admission like this, I, I think it really shows that the system can't be controlled. Um, the book actually goes into great detail, probably about 60 pages, explaining why the mechanisms that uh, economists believe can control the money supply no longer work. Um, but fundamentally, it's because you have this battle between the desire of the banking sector to create as much money as possible to maximize their profits because the more money they create the more they lend the more they lend the more interest they receive and the need of the Bank of England to kind of protect the public interest to to limit inflation and instability in the economy and these two it, for the last 50 years at least it's been the um, the profit motive of the banks that has won out so what are the consequences of this well firstly we know that banks create too much money uh, they create this money for the wrong things. So we see the majority of money, when it's newly created, it goes straight into the housing market and into the financial sector. Very little, about 13% over the last 10 years, has gone into non-financial businesses. So this is uh, the real, real economy. You know, the jobs, uh, shops, businesses, and factories, essentially. Um, and about 10% has gone into credit cards and personal loans, consumer finance. And this has led to financial crisis, as Adair Turner said, and as we saw this morning. Some of the headlines that have been coming out of the, the last couple of days are getting worse and worse. Britain is experiencing a worse slump than during the Great Depression. For a while, we've been talking about, oh, we're in recovery, growth has been 0.1%, and then now we're back into the double, recession, double dip recession, and then we're back into recovery again, and now we're back into the triple dip recession. Uh, this is a real roller coaster. Global unemployment will reach a record 200 million in 2013. Now, 200 million people, is there nothing useful for those people to be doing, really, given the situation we're in right now? But there's not enough money, there's not enough uh, numbers in computer systems created by the banking sector to allow those people to, to do something useful. Uh, it's led to massive indebtedness because money is created by banks when they make loans, so as the money supply goes up, the debt goes up as well. And then house prices, you know, an entire generation has been priced out of being able to buy a home. Uh, the inequality that we discussed, the instability, which is really, really bad for business. Um, you'll always hear uh, economists and lobbyists for the banks saying that 
the current banking system is good because it provides credit for business and helps the economy to grow. But actually, we believe that on net, uh, this current banking system is really harmful for the business economy and for actual you know, wealth creation. It's very environmentally destructive, as we talked about this morning. Um, and it's bad for democracy as well. You know, the banks now have more power to shape the economy through their lending than the whole of government. But we have all these MPs scrutinizing what the government does and only about 80 board members paying attention to what the banks are doing. And the reason that the system's got to this point is because every time something's gone wrong with the current banking system, the government has stepped in with a safety net or a new support measure to allow the system to continue. And you've seen this at its most extreme over the last sort of five or six years. Now, I want to make the point that this is, um, as some people th assume that if the banking system is structured in a certain way, it's because some wise men have sat down and designed it. Um, but the current banking system is, without getting into the uh, evolutionist debate here, there's no signs of intelligent design in the current banking system. <laughs> it's evolved over time, and every time there's been a crisis, there's been some new uh, package from the government, some new measure from the Bank of England, um, and you know, things like the bailouts, the uh, funding for lending, all these different schemes to keep the system going. Now, sometimes evolution works out really well and you get something that's you know, quite beautiful and efficient and effective. Sometimes it doesn't work out that well. <laughs> and there's no prize for guessing which of these two fish represents the banking sector right now. So, so the thing is, you, if you, you, know, you know if you build your house on sand, um, it's going to collapse. This is what we have at the moment. We have a banking system that is really built on sand. It doesn't matter how much uh, reinforcement or how much support you do, you know, it's not enough to go to the occupants and say, you know, please tread lightly while you're inside the house because it's a bit unstable. And if you could lose some weight, that would be great too. Um, you have to wipe it away. You have to start again and build something on firm foundations from the ground up. And I, this is what we believe we're doing in the buck here. Um, so we have this very dysfunctional system that isn't really working in the interest of the economy or in, society, in the interest of society. Um, and my, my colleague, Andrew Jackson, who's done by far the largest part of the work on this book, found this quote, which I think really sums up part of the ethos um, behind the book. Our problems are man-made, therefore they may be solved by man. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. You know, the monetary system is just a collection of rules and laws and computer systems. And it's actually remarkably easy to change. The real challenges are the things like the environmental crisis, the, uh, the water crisis, the energy crisis, the, the changes that we're going to see over the next 40 years, the growing population. Those are real, tangible problems that we need to find real practical ways of dealing with. This is just an artificial monetary system. It's a computer system. So we can't let ourselves be distracted from those big challenges by this artificial, broken, dysfunctional monetary system. So, what do we do? Well, I'll take you through these quickly and then we'll go into a bit more detail on each of them. First thing is that we need to remove the power of banks to create money. We need to return that power to a transparent and accountable process. Uh, we have money created free of debt. We create money only when inflation is low and stable. Uh, we make sure that any new money goes into the real economy instead of into the financial markets and property. And uh, we give us, as customers of banks and as members of the public, control and transparency over how our money is actually invested. First one, removing the power of banks to create money. Well, I don't want to take you through all the technical details of how this is done. Um, it's explained quite simply in the book. But we'll also be releasing in the next month a series of videos that go through step by step if you prefer to see things visually. But um, just a quick overview. As I said, banks currently have the power to create money because the liabilities that they issue are the money that we use in the economy. So money creating organizations issue liabilities that are treated as media of exchange by others. We use these liabilities to make payments to each other. In the current system, we're here using the liabilities of these banks to make our payments. And what we do through the particular reforms outlined in the book is that we actually start using money that is created by the Bank of England. So instead of you using a promise to pay from a bank as your way of paying somebody else, you're actually using real electronic money that is being created by the Bank of England. What this means for you as a customer of a bank is that you have two options when you get your salary. 
You can either say to the bank, look, keep it safe for me, or you can say to them, I want you to go and invest it for me. I want to get some interest. And if you say you want your money to be kept safe, then this would be put into a transaction account, which is effectively uh, the same as a current account now. But the difference between a current account and these new accounts is that your money would actually be at the Bank of England. It would be electronic money stored electronically at the Bank of England. Um, and that would actually be yours. It wouldn't be the bank's. They wouldn't be able to play with it, to invest it, to do anything with it. This investment account, what you're actually doing there is you're giving your electronic money that was created by the bank, the Bank of England, to your bank so that they can then go and lend it to somebody else. And what this does, through the fairly simple rule changes and a few accounting changes, this makes banks into what people think they are now, which is intermediaries, uh, middlemen between savers and borrowers. They post, you know, after this reform, what banks will be doing is taking money from savers and investors and actually lending it to borrowers, doing exactly what people think they do now. So with banks no longer having the power to create money, we need to return that power to a transparent and accountable process. You know, we know, I mean, I'm sure like everybody is here because they know that we can't trust banks to create money for all the reasons that we've discussed. But I guess you wouldn't trust these people either. Because the problem is that politicians have the same incentives to abuse the power to create money as the banks do. You know, the more of it they create, the more of an artificial boom they can create in the economy to get people to vote for them. And that's going you know, to end up badly. So what you need to do, the, the absolute key thing that needs to be done, is that you have to separate the decision over how much money is created and what that money is used for. Because as soon as the same person or the same organization is making those two decisions, you have a conflict of interest. So what we suggested is that the, uh, a new committee, the Money Creation Committee, which would replace the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, becomes responsible for deciding how much the money in the economy needs to increase or decrease by. And the government would be responsible for actually deciding how to get that money into the economy. The really important thing is that you make sure that this money creation committee is sheltered from lobbyists, either from the elected government of the day, who will have their own objectives for what they want the economy to do, which might not line up with the best interests of the economy, and from the banks as well. So this needs to be, this whole process needs to be transparent, accountable, uh, accountable to Parliament, but we can't have George Osborne calling up the Money Creation Committee and saying, can you put another £100 billion pounds into the economy because I really need a recovery before 2015. Then you need to make sure that money is only created when inflation is low and stable. So let me show you what happens with the current system. So banks increase their lending, which means they're creating more money. This starts to push prices up, and they think the economy's healthy, so they lend more. And they say, wow, look at house prices, we should be lending even more. And then at this point, you're in a bubble, but everybody's convincing themselves it's not a bubble. And this is more or less what has happened to the money supply over the last 40 years, and particularly over the last 10 years. Um, what would happen with the Money Creation Committee is that they start putting money into the economy, and when it starts to cause price rises, so it starts to cause inflation, then they stop. And when the inflation goes down, they create money again, and then they stop again until things settle out. And it's instead of when the banks are creating money, the more they create, the more inflation there is, and the more they want to create because they think, you know, house prices are rising so we can afford to lend more to people to buy houses. The Money Creation Committee actually has a responsibility to stop creating money when it causes inflation. So it's completely the opposite of what the banks will do in that situation. But, you know, we, we often get the question, isn't all money creation inflationary? Isn't all money creation going to push up prices? Well, it really depends. Um, because if you put 40% of all the new money you create into housing and into financial markets, then you're going to expect prices in those markets to go up. And we've seen that with housing. Um, we've seen that with the stock market. I, the, I don't know if you've seen the newspaper yesterday, but there was a weird headline. First it was, uh, this slump is worse than the Great Depression, and beneath that, its markets hit four and a half year high. It's like, why is this? Why? <laughs> Um, and it's a, it's a symptom of where the money's going, and particularly quantitative easing. But, and if you put, instead, put money into uh, non-financial businesses, so into the real economy, then what you're going to do is stimulate that part of the economy. Um, you know, we have two and a half million people at home at the moment doing nothing. They can be employed. And what you'll actually get is um, economic activity will increase. So the, um, the economy will grow. So not all money creation is inflationary. It can actually... If it's put into the right parts of the economy, it can help the economy to grow faster 
than any sort of inflationary pressure. Okay, we need to create money free of debt. Now, this is one of the most fundamental points of this whole book because the current rules of the monetary system, when 97% of all the money we're using is created by banks when they're making loans, that means that the more money we want in the economy, the more debt we have to have. If we've just had a crisis and we need some new money into the economy, then the only real way to get it in there is to have the banks increase their lending, which is why you see such an emphasis now on, well, we've got to get banks lending again, even though the crisis was caused by people having too much debt. Vice versa, if we want less debt in the economy, then we have to have less money, because as you repay your debts, that money is effectively cancelled out. It's just the reverse accounting process of money creation. Um, what we actually need is we need less debt and we need more money in the economy to get out of this current crisis, this current recession. That's impossible in the current system. As you see here, the two of them are tied together. Um, as the money supply goes up, the debt goes up, because they're basically the money and the debt is the opposite side of the same accounting entry, the same balance sheet. So this is what we can expect to see happen if we do have a recovery now with the current system, that the debt will rise. And eventually this is going to lead to yet another crisis, but it may be much, much worse the next time. Um, what these reforms do is they separate the creation of money from the creation of debt. So when, um, when banks are lending, they're actually transferring existing money um, from a, a saver to a borrower. But they're not creating money in the process. So the money can be created, and that money can be used to pay off a lot of the existing debt. And also because of some of the other changes that need to be made uh, to the accounting, which are explained in the book, it allows us to pay off nearly a trillion pounds of household and personal debt over the course of about 20 years. Now, just think about how much of a complete transformation that will make for the lives of, of most of the people in this country to not have this um, enormous debt. You know, the personal debt is as high as it's ever been. And this changes to the system actually allow this debt to be reduced. So instead of having this annual interest charge on the entire money supply of 108 billion to 217 billion a year, that could be cut down. Could be cut down to possibly half of that, maybe even less. Okay, fifth thing, we need to put money into the real economy. We talked briefly about this. But the way, there's about four options that you could use to get this money into the economy. And um, okay, so you can spend more on public services, put the money in through the government. You can cut taxes. Uh, you could pay down the national debt. Or you could actually just divide it up between people and give it directly to people. So there, there's, I mean, we talk in the book about you know, the, the combination of these that you would probably want to use and why actually paying down the national debt should be probably the last priority. Um, but the important thing is that all of these things, if they're done right, will get money into the real economy. Whereas what we have now at the moment, we have banks putting most of the money into housing and financial markets. And some of this money trickles out of that market into the real economy. What we'd like to see is that as the money comes in, as it's created, it goes to government, and then it comes into the real economy first. And then the banks need to borrow that money from people and businesses in the real economy before they can then lend it to, well, either back to the real economy, back to businesses, or to housing and to the financial markets. One of the things that we would like to see is that this flow of money into the financial markets, into speculation, and um, sort of the trading and that sort of stuff should really be reduced. So, six, we need to give ourselves control and transparency over where our money is invested. Now, I saw this advert the other day, which, which really made me laugh. Ever wondered where your money goes? Um, this is Lloyd's TSB saying, have you ever wondered where your money goes? And I think, yes, yes yeah. <laughs> I think they weren't aware of the Move Your Money campaign or how much uh, they were falling into their trap there. Um, because, no, most people don't think about where their money goes. Um, and that's because the bank never tells you. So one of the things that we would do as part of these reforms is require that if you're putting your money into an investment account, you're giving your money up so that the bank can go and invest it. The bank actually will tell you, okay, we're going to use it for you know, for the arms trade, for the oil industry, for tar sands, for, um, you know, investing in businesses or investing in commodity speculation. And, you know, some people, you know, we're not naive, some people won't care about this. They're not going to be bothered. But it means that the people who do care what their money's used for have that option to, to opt out, basically, to say, I don't want my money to be used in this way. Um, 
and to choose different accounts where the money will be used differently. Is it going to be easy to get this through? Of course not. There's going to be massive opposition and there's huge vested interests. Um, and you know, some of the things that we'll hear over the next few years as these ideas get out into the mainstream, things like oh, it'll be inflationary. If you allow the state to create money, that's going to cause inflation. Well, you know, really, this is quite an easy one to answer. Which of these two is most likely to cause inflation? You know, banks who want to create as much money as possible because they maximize their profits by creating more, or a committee that is responsible for stopping money creation when inflation starts to go up. You know, it's, it's quite a clear choice. And then you'll get, oh, it'll be hyperinflationary. We'll end up like Zimbabwe or Germany in the 1920s. Well, the, the people making that claim, unfortunately, are very uh, ignorant of how this system, sorry, of, of what actually happened in Zimbabwe and what actually happened in Weimar Republic Germany. Now, in the, um, in the book, there's a whole appendix on Zimbabwe and other examples where uh, there have been hyperinflations and other examples where states have created money without hyperinflations. But in, uh, there's a study that we've quoted in there where they go through all 50 recorded hyperinflations in history and found that all of them there's been a, you know, either an economic collapse or a political collapse or a war before the hyperinflation actually started. It wasn't just because some uh, central bankers started printing money willy-nilly there was some fundamental collapse in the economy before these hyperinflation started. Um, so the idea that this will lead to hyperinflation is, is um, well, very misguided. You'll hear this one all the time. It will drastically reduce the level of credit. We actually heard it from the Independent Commission on Banking. And uh, we asked them what they meant by the word drastic. You know, do they mean like a 10% or a 50%? Uh, they didn't really know. They didn't get back to us on that. We also asked them if we could see their calculations or their modeling or the you know, working out that they'd done to show that it would be drastic. And funnily enough, they didn't get back to us on that either. Um, so this is just a knee-jerk reaction without really understanding the way the system works. I mean, the savings products at the moment where people have said, I don't need my money for the next six or 12 months. Already today, there is enough money in those accounts or enough liabilities um, to cover all of the investment that is needed in the business economy and to keep people being able to buy houses without pushing house prices up. So there's already enough money out there to, to provide finance to the bits of the economy that we really need. There might not be enough money to push house prices up at you know, 200% in 10 years. There might not be enough money to fund all this speculation in the financial markets. And I think that's, that's a good thing. And then you'll hear this, uh, this one, well, you'll kill Britain's best industry. You know, we need, we need the banking sector because the taxes they pay, pay for our schools and our hospitals. And if, if not, we'd all be living, you know, scratching out or living in the dirt. Um, it's not true. Uh, the, the banking sector, in the year that it paid the most tax in history, manufacturing in this country paid three times more tax. Does anybody want to take a guess at what this number represents? It's the number of workers in banking relative to the numbers of workers in the rest of the economy. Banking only employs one in every 53 people. So for every one person in banking, every one person in this industry that we're protecting by not asking them to make changes and not asking them to, to reform the way that they do business, there are 52 people in the rest of the economy that are negatively affected by the impacts of this banking sector. So, you know, th these reforms are really for the other 98% of the working population, you know, for the businesses and for the people with jobs outside of banking. Now, I should probably qualify this. Is there's nothing personal about what we're doing against banks or the people who work in them. It's the industry that is the problem. It's the design of the industry and the effects that it's having. And it's not about the people in them. It's about actually changing the rules of the game and the way these, these companies can operate. Uh, you'll also hear it's too radical, which is quite bizarre, given that we're just proposing that this law from the 1840s is updated. I can't imagine the conservatives of 1840s were really considered to be radicals. So, the benefits of reforming, we get stable money, we get this instead of this, we get debt falling like this, Instead of house price bubbles, we'll have house prices that will stay flat until earnings have actually caught up. 
and they become affordable again. On employment, I just want to give you one example of how ridiculous this current system is to wrap up with. We have 2.5 million people sat at home doing nothing, desperately looking for something useful to do for a job. Um, we also have uh, things that need doing in the economy. We have schools that need rebuilding. And the government's been sort of dilly-dallying over this school rebuilding program for the last few years, saying, oh, well, there's not enough money, we're in a recession, we need to get our public finances under order. And they finally come out and allocated two billion pounds for rebuilding schools in England. Um, now, two billion pounds sounds like a lot of money. And uh, it's so much money that they've had to borrow it from a private finance initiative. So they're actually borrowing money that is created through accounting entries from banks and paying interest on that because they haven't got enough money of their own to fund rebuilding the schools. Now, the reason for that, that according to um, the BBC, is that this arrangement will spare the Department for Education's meagre capital budget, the annual value of which has been halved over this parliament to £3.8 billion. Pounds. So £3.8 billion pounds for rebuilding schools and keeping this whole education system, you know, the actual physical infrastructure of this, in, in order. Again, sounds like a lot of money, but this green, this green line at the top here is how much money has been put into uh, mortgages and consumer finance over the last uh, 20-odd years. In June 1999, the banks created £4.5 billion pounds of new money in one month to put into the property market, into buying existing houses and building a few new ones. In July 2005, they created £7 billion pounds in one month. And then in September 2007, they created £16 billion pounds one month to go into property. So in the space of one week, they've created as much money as the government is willing to spend on rebuilding schools in an entire year. Now this is crazy. If we give banks the power to create money, this is what they're going to do. They're going to put it into markets like this instead of doing things that we actually need to do. And as I said before, we can't allow this system to continue working the way it is, given the real challenges that we're going to face over the next 40 years. Um, so this is what the book is about. It's, um, it can be heavy going at parts. It's, uh, we've had to kind of design it partly for the economists who would normally dismiss these sort of ideas, but we have tried to write it so that if you're not, if you don't have that background in economics, if you start from the beginning, uh, your knowledge will build up and this will really start to make sense. And if you get to the end, then you will know more about the monetary system than 99% of professional economists. <laughs> so. So yeah, so this is it. This is what we need to do. Uh, the pressure is really on because of the real challenges that we're facing. And it really is, I mean, this, uh, the movement in this country is by far the strongest in the world. Um, the people in this room, I mean, this is the biggest gathering that I know of for reforming the monetary system. So if, if we don't do it, then nobody else is going to push it through. So it's really down to us. Um, so that's what the rest of this afternoon is going to be about and um, how we really sort of change the system.